In the latter part of the 8th century BC, an age of exploration had begun for the ancient Greeks, venturing out into the wider Mediterranean and Black Sea Basin in search for fertile lands and opportunities. Permanent enclaves began to spring up all around the shores of the Mediterranean, with some beginning as trading outposts, others as settlements of farmers cultivating crops like olives and wheat. Some of these settlements would grow to become cities, with notable cities like Massalia, or modern-day Marseille, Naples, and Byzantium being founded around this time. Further east of the Greek mainland, expeditions were organized to explore the uncharted waters of the Black Sea. Stories of strange people who lived on the misty shores of the north began circulating in the Greek world. People who were half man, half horse, and who wandered the earth endlessly. An appropriate description for nomadic pastoralists who had no cities. As Greek colonists began flooding into the Black Sea coast in the 7th and 6th centuries, the urban world of the Greeks would come face to face with the nomadic, tribal world of the steppe for the first time in Western history. These otherworldly people were known as the Scythians, the ancient forebearers of modern-day Central Asian nomads, as well as the Huns, Mongols, and the Turks. They would come to dominate a vast area, ranging from their homelands in the Altai Mountains of southern Siberia, skirting the fringes of western China, and down to the Black Sea coast. It is on these northern shores of the Black Sea that they would encounter the Greek colonists and establish close trade relations and cultural exchange. Greek writers and philosophers began traveling to the Pontic Steppe and wrote accounts of the Scythian way of life, of which the writings of the Greek historian Herodotus give us a colorful image of the Scythian world. To this day, historians are uncertain about the exact origin of the Scythians, but there are two prevailing hypotheses on where they come from. The first hypothesis proposed by Soviet and Russian researchers roughly followed the account given by Herodotus that the Scythians were an Eastern Iranian-speaking group who arrived from the area of Transoxiana and Xinjiang. The second hypothesis states that the Scythians were descended from an earlier Bronze Age culture called the Srebnaya culture, an Iranic people native to the Pontic steppe area. The landscape that the Scythians inhabited was the Eurasian steppe, a flat open terrain that stretched from the Great Hungarian Plain in Europe all the way to Manchuria in the east, a huge expanse of land spanning 5,000 miles. As one moves further and further west, the Eurasian steppe begins to change in climate. Beginning in Mongolia on the far eastern side, the climate is colder and the vegetation is dry. As one progresses further west, the temperature becomes more moderate and the grass becomes greener and lusher. This variation in climate is called the steppe gradient, and it could have been a contributing factor to the movement of peoples in the region, and in turn, a catalyst for conflict. Borders and boundaries between tribes were fluid and constantly changing. Because the pastoralist economy was primarily based off of mobile assets like cattle and animal products, the Scythian home would be wherever there was grazing space for sheep, goats, and horses. This constant mobility of peoples and goods was characteristic of the area for thousands of years and led to a culture of raiding and counter-raiding amongst different tribes. Similar to the Wild West on the American continent, anarchy was the status quo on the Eurasian steppe with kidnapping, pillaging, and rape being commonplace. As nomads, by their very nature, are not static, they are constantly moving to new pastures with some tribes forming large confederacies, while other tribes break off from the rest and ride great distances to set themselves up in positions of power, ruling over the natives before riding off again. From the perspective of Herodotus, someone brought up in the world of cities and states, the complexity of nomadic society would have been difficult to understand. Archaeology is also limited in the sense that it can only provide a snapshot of this fast-moving historical picture. Now the term Scythian can be used more broadly as an umbrella term to describe all the nomadic tribes that existed during the Iron Age in Central Asia. These tribes shared a similar culture and were speakers of Iranian languages. Peoples associated with the wider Scythian cultures included the Cimmerians, the Saka, the Mazagate, and the Sarmatians. 
For the purpose of this video, we will be focusing on the Scythians of the Pontic Steppe specifically. Our main sources of information on the Scythians come from the written sources left by the Greeks, Persians, and Assyrians, the settled societies that neighbored the Scythians. The Scythians themselves left no written records of their own, leaving us only with what other people said about them. Apart from the written sources, our other source of information comes from archaeology. Scattered across the Eurasian steppe, the Scythians left several large ice tombs that were covered by large mounds of earth, called kurgans. Some of these kurgans were as tall as 70 feet, and could be found in disparate areas ranging from the Balkans, southern Russia, Mongolia, and even Siberia. Incredible amounts of wealth often accompanied the deceased into the afterlife, such as carefully crafted gold vessels, weapons, armor, and food. Even the wives and concubines of the king would be buried close by, along with other servants and sometimes even multiple horses would be killed and buried too. Herodotus provides a description of the burial of a Scythian king, saying, quote, Having laid out the corpse in the tomb on a mattress and planted spears on both sides of the body, beams are stretched across above it to form a roof, which is covered over with mats. In the space around the king's body, they bury one of his concubines after strangling her and his cupbearer, carver, equerry, attendant messenger, horses, the pick of everything else, and golden bulls. Having done this, they heap up a great barrow. End quote. Like the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, or the emperors of imperial China, the Scythian kings were buried with all of the comforts and necessities that they would need in the afterlife, the hope being that they would be sufficiently content to remain in their new domain and not interfere in the world of the living. Once the king was laid to rest, an enormous amount of human effort was exerted to build the burial mound, displaying the prestige and power of the deceased king for all to see. Other practical advantages of creating a large mound was deterring grave robbers from looting. In hindsight, this deterrent was incredibly effective because it would be thousands of years later, in the 18th century, when Russian researchers would rediscover these ice tombs that remained largely undisturbed in the desolate wilderness of the steppe. The artifacts uncovered in these tombs showcase the mastery the Scythians had as artisans, with depictions of animals and nature being a central theme in their art style. Deer, lions, panthers, and horses were popularly portrayed, along with mythological beasts such as griffins and sirens. These artifacts showcase the Scythians' obsession with nature and how it transcended their physical and spiritual world. These naturalistic depictions even made it on their skin, with tattooed mummies also being unearthed in these ice tombs. One of the most famous Scythian mummies discovered was dubbed the Ice Maiden, she was discovered in an undisturbed kurgan that dated to the 5th century BC and was so well preserved that the skin bearing her tattoos was still visible when her mummy was unearthed. On the one hand, the Scythians revered and respected their own dead, burying them with treasures and large edifices. But on the other hand, they could be especially gruesome to their fallen enemies. One particularly grim custom that was practiced by the Scythians and other nomadic peoples was that after they would slay an enemy, they would take the deceased's skull and make a drinking cup out of it, sometimes highly decorated with gold or silver encrusted around the rim of the cup. Herodotus describes this practice in more detail, saying, The skulls of their enemies, not indeed of all, but of those whom they most detest, they treat as follows. Having sawn off the portion below the eyebrows and cleaned out the inside, they cover the outside with leather. When a man is poor, this is all he does, but if he is rich, he also lines the inside with gold. In either case, the skull is used as a drinking cup. They do the same with the skulls of their own kith and kin if they have been a feud with them and have vanquished them in the presence of the king. When strangers whom they deem of any account come to visit them, these skulls are handed round and the host tells how that these were his relations who made war upon him, and how that he got the better of them, all this being looked upon as a proof of bravery." End quote. 
This gruesome tradition of making skull cups would continue among the steppe peoples long after the Scythians had left. Most notably, the practice would be mentioned again some 1500 years later with the medieval Bulgars in the 9th century. The Bulgars, a nomadic steppe people themselves, came into conflict with the Eastern Romans and defeated them in battle. The Bulgarian king Krum, after capturing the Byzantine emperor Nicephorus, famously made a drinking cup out of his skull. It was clear that alcohol played an important part in Scythian culture, with large amounts of horses, sheep, and goats at their disposal, the Scythians' main alcoholic beverage was fermented milk, a drink that is enjoyed by pastoralist people to this day. As commercial ties with Greece and Persia developed over the centuries, the Scythians would add wine to their drink menu and were known to drink it undiluted, much to the Greeks' disgust as they normally drank wine diluted in water and saw the Scythian drinking habit as barbaric. Alcohol was not the only vice that the Scythians engaged in. Interestingly, the Scythians were recorded by ancient sources as consuming large amounts of cannabis. Its use ranged from using hemp to weave their clothing, burning it in funeral rituals, using it for pain relief from injuries sustained in combat, and using it recreationally. Herodotus mentions the Scythians using cannabis in his histories, saying, quote, After the burial, they set up three poles leaning together to a point and cover them with woolen mats. They make a pit in the center beneath the poles and throw red hot stones into it. They take the seed of the hemp and creeping under the mats they throw it on the red hot stones and being thrown it smolders and sends forth so much steam that no Greek vapor bath could surpass it. The Scythians howl in their joy at the vapor bath. End quote. Archaeological evidence from Scythian burial mounds support this claim. One notable burial mound of a Scythian warrior who had his head drilled, possibly to reduce swelling from a wound, found large amounts of dried cannabis bud buried with him, presumably for use in the afterlife. Russian excavators made a stunning discovery in 2015 when they discovered a solid gold bong that was used 2,400 years ago. It was found inside a burial mound in the Caucasus region. Black residue was detected on the inner portion of one of the gold vessels, and upon further analysis of the residue, researchers concluded that the substance was not just cannabis, but also opium. Now that we have painted a summary picture of the Scythian world, let us talk about their famous military system that was so effective that it shook the geopolitical stage to its core. At the center of the Scythian military was its famous horse archer unit. This was innovative for its time, when most other armies would have consisted mainly of infantry and maybe some chariots. The speed of a horse was the fastest speed humans were capable of going for millennia until the invention of the steam engine train. This mobility was harnessed by the Scythians in a way that proved devastating to their enemies. Contingents of charging Scythian horse archers could reach speeds up to 30 to 40 miles an hour, raining arrows down on enemy lines before wheeling away at the last moment, giving their enemy infantry no opportunity to respond. This guerrilla-style attack could be repeated multiple times until the enemy lines begin to break, allowing the Scythians to finish off the enemy with brutal efficiency. Coupled with the mobility of the horse, the range of the composite bow completed the deadly effectiveness of the Scythian mounted horse archer. The stiffness and power of the bow allowed arrows to reach a distance of up to 200 yards with considerable accuracy. Professor Barry Cunliffe described the effectiveness of the Scythian arrows and how devastating they were to the unfortunate souls who got shot with them. Made from bronze, the arrowheads had small hooks on them, so if you attempted to pull the arrow out, it would rip the wound apart, causing excruciating agony. The Scythians also made use of poison in their arrows. They would take the venom of pregnant female snakes, which is when the venom was at its most potent, and mix it with blood. After leaving the mixture to ferment for a few weeks, they would smear their arrows in it, assuring death for anyone who got pierced by them. 
For all these tangible advantages the Scythians had in war, it was the intangible advantages that could win them the battle without firing a single shot. The psychological edge the Scythians had is impossible to quantify, yet we know from Herodotus that their reputation in battle was known by all throughout the ancient world, and this led to Scythian mercenaries being highly coveted by the Greek and Assyrian kings. Fear and terror would also play their part, with Herodotus saying that the Scythians would often decapitate the enemies they slew to bring back to their king. Next, they scalped the severed head in order to use the scalp as a napkin. A warrior would either hang the scalps from their horse's bridle or fashion a cloak out of them as a way to show off their prowess in battle for all to see. It is with the horse and bow that the Scythians would bring down the world's superpowers of their day and spread terror to the settled societies they raided. In the 7th century BC, the Scythians would make their debut on the world stage, and it would completely change the political landscape in the Middle East forever. The Assyrians at the time, the world's great superpower, had for centuries dominated their neighbors with an almost famous if not horrific level of brutality. But by the time the Scythians entered the Middle East, Assyria was beginning to crumble under pressure from their neighbors such as the Medes, Babylonians, and another nomadic group called the Cimmerians. With the region becoming increasingly unstable, the Scythians saw an opportunity for plunder and loot. Herodotus writes that around the year 653 BC, a horde of Scythians led by a king named Madius move into what is now northern Iran and laid waste to the Medes and overthrew them. The Scythians had the backing of the Assyrian Empire at the time, using them as a sort of wrecking ball to use against their regional adversaries, the Medes. As a reward for their help, the Assyrians gave Madius and his Scythians control over Media. The Medes, being a semi-nomadic people themselves, were related to the Scythians and their languages were both mutually intelligible without the need of an interpreter when speaking to each other. With the Medes in northwestern Iran now subjugated, Madius and his horde of Scythians would stream over to the west, raping and pillaging all the way down to Egypt before being bribed by the Egyptians to turn back. Returning back to Media, the Scythians would rule there for 28 years. Herodotus recounts this in his histories by saying, quote, For 28 years, the Scythians ruled over Asia, and during this time they, full of arrogance and disdain, all devastated. For, besides the fact that they each charge tribute, which imposes on all, they are, going round the country, robbed of all what each possessed." End quote. This domination by the Scythians would eventually be broken by a powerful Median king named Cyaxares. Herodotus tells the story of how Cyaxares was able to do this. He invited the Scythian leaders to a lavish banquet, where the Scythians succumbed to the delight of alcohol. And in their drunken stupor, Cyaxarus had them all put to death. With the leadership of the Scythians decapitated, they were repelled from the realm of the Medes, and Cyaxarus took control, and declared himself king of the Medes. The remainder of the Scythians would flee back across the Caucasus Mountains, and back into southern Russia. Cyaxares, now in full control of Media, mobilized his army and marched on Assyria in the west, keen to punish them for employing the Scythians to oppress them 28 years earlier. He made an alliance with Babylon to attack the Assyrian capital city of Nineveh. At the time, Nineveh was the largest city in the world and the peak of civilization, comparable to what cities like Baghdad or Constantinople would achieve. After initially being unsuccessful in taking the city, Cyaxares and the Babylonians would try again in the year 613 BC, and this time, a horde of Scythian mercenaries joined their ranks. After a three-month siege, the defenses of the city were breached, and the plundering of Nineveh began, paving the way for the end of the Assyrian Empire, an almost unthinkable event given it was the undisputed world superpower just 20 years prior. With the toppling of the Assyrian Empire, the Scythians earned the reputation as brutal and ferocious warriors, capable of punching above their weight. Just 70 years prior to the fall of Nineveh, the Scythians were an obscure, unknown people on the edge of the known world, 
and in less than a century, they ruled the Medes for decades and contributed to the fall of Assyria. It would be more than a hundred years later, in 514 BC, when the Scythians would once again challenge the dominant world power. This time, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, then the largest empire the world had ever seen, and this time, they would come to bring the fight to the Scythians in their own territory. The Persians were relative newcomers on the world stage, having been living in the shadows of other large states for centuries. They would rise from relative obscurity to dominate their neighbors, the Medes, Babylonians, and the Assyrians in the process, inheriting the age-old tradition of Mesopotamian civilization. The head of state of the Persian Empire, called the King of Kings, was Darius the Great. Darius is best known for his conflict with the Greek city-states, but before he made war with the Greeks, he first sought to secure his borders to the north. The Scythian invasion of Media was still fresh in the collective memory of the Persians, and Darius was well aware of the threat they posed to his empire. Vengeance was long overdue. There was also economic motivations to attacking the Scythians. The control of goods coming from the north of the Black Sea was strategically important for Darius because it was a way to exert pressure on the Greeks down south, who relied on Scythian exports of gold, grain, hides, and furs. Darius would launch his Scythian campaign, and according to Herodotus, the Persian army numbered a monumental 700,000 men. Now while this number must have been embellished, there is little doubt that this army must have been one of the largest forces fielded in this time period. In the campaigning season of 513, Darius led his army across the Bosporus Strait on a floating bridge constructed of boats, crossing into Europe for the first time. He also ordered an Ionian naval detachment, the Ionians being the Greeks that lived under the Persian Empire. This naval detachment would sail ahead to the Danube and build a bridge across the river. Moving forward, Darius marched his army through Thrace, northwards towards the Danube River, meeting little opposition on the way except for some Gete tribesmen, whom he quickly defeated and enslaved. Upon reaching the Danube, the Persians crossed the bridge constructed by the Ionians there and entered Scythian territory. On the opposing side, the Scythians were led by a king named Idan Thursos. Knowing the size of the Persian army, Idan Thursos didn't dare risk a direct confrontation with the Persian army and instead opted for a scorched earth strategy. The Scythians would fall back, drawing the Persian army deeper and deeper into the desolate steppe land, while also driving off their herds of cattle, blocking up the wells, and burning the grass, always staying one day's march ahead of the Persian army. When the Persians would venture off to forage for food, the Scythians would harass and launch surprise attacks on their hunting parties, denying them what little sustenance was left. Incensed that the Scythians would not come to battle, Darius sent a letter to the Scythian camp saying, quote, You extraordinary man, why do you keep fleeing when you can certainly do otherwise? If you think you are able to challenge my power, then stop your wandering and stand to fight it out. Or if you acknowledge that you are too weak for that course, then you should stop running away. Bring gifts of earth and water to your master and enter into negotiations with him. End quote. Iden Thursis responded to this letter, saying, quote, This is my situation, Persian. I have never yet fled from anyone out of fear before, and I'm not fleeing from you now. What I have been doing is in fact no different from what I have been accustomed to do in times of peace. I'll tell you why I do not engage you now. It is because we have neither towns nor cultivated land to worry about being captured or raised, which might induce us to engage you in battle sooner. But if you really must come to battle without further delay, know that we do have ancestral graves. So come on and find them, and try and destroy them, and you will know whether or not we shall fight for the graves. But before that, we shall not engage you in battle unless we see fit to do so. Instead of gifts of earth and water, I shall send you the kind of tokens you really merit. And in response to your claim to be my master, I tell you, weep. That is your answer from the Scythians. End quote. With the Persian army demoralized and worn down, Darius decided to abandon the campaign and retreat under the cover of darkness, leaving the remnants of his camp to deceive the Scythian scouts. 
When the Scythians realized what was happening, they divided their army in two and sent one part to track the retreating Persians, while the second part sped up to the Danube River to persuade the Ionians to destroy the bridge, cutting off the Persian retreat. The Ionians did not listen, and the dispirited Persians were able to cross the Danube into the relative safety of Thrace. With the Persians driven off, the Scythians were able to preserve their independence, eventually recovering their losses of grassland. By the 4th century BC, the Pontic Steppe Scythians began to shift their focus more to the west towards Thrace and Macedonia, with the Danube River acting as a border between Scythian and Greek influence. Greek sources talk about a capable Scythian king named Atias, who was able to unite the Scythian tribes into a confederation under his leadership. This put the Scythian realm in direct contact with the Greek Macedonian kingdom in the Balkans under their king Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. Atias increasingly encroached on the Macedonian sphere of influence in the Balkans, and this led to some precarious interactions between the two. Greek sources recount of one collision between Philip and Atias during the former siege of Byzantium. When Philip requested aid and supplies to assist in the siege effort, Atias refused to provide for them, saying that the land was barren and he had no resources to spare. In another interaction, King Philip wished to build a statue dedicated to Hercules near the Danube River, which the Scythians also refused. This was the last straw for Philip, and he mobilized his army to punish Atias and the Scythians. Very little is known about the sizes of the two armies, but the Greek sources say that they made on the plains of Dobruja in modern-day Romania. The year was 339 BC when the two armies clashed, with considerable losses on both sides. Atias himself was slain in the battle, and Philip nearly lost his life too, with his horse being killed in the fray. Realizing their leader was slain, the Scythian army fled the battlefield in defeat, conceding control of the Eastern Balkans to the Macedonians. War reparations were paid to the Macedonians in the form of 20,000 Scythian concubines, as well as the same number of horses. As quickly as Atias assembled the Scythian tribes under one confederation, it disintegrated just as quickly upon his death, with the Scythian tribes divided amongst themselves once again. This lack of unity began the process of gradual decline for the Scythians living in the Pontic Steppe for the next few centuries. By 200 BC, other steppe nomads from the east would begin to wander into the traditional Scythian lands, disrupting their communities and eventually subjugating them. These nomadic steppe cousins from the east were called the Sarmatians, and they shared much of the same customs and origins as the Scythians, being an Iranic people themselves. By the 2nd century AD, archaeological evidence showed that the Scythians have been largely assimilated by the Sarmatians, who would continue living in the Pontic steppe until they too were displaced by Germanic Gothic invasions in the 3rd century. The Sarmatians would carry on the torch of being the nomadic horse lords of the east, a tradition that would be carried on by them and other peoples who would come after, with this way of life continuing for millennia, even into the present day with traditional pastoralists in countries like Mongolia and Tajikistan. The Scythians would fade away from collective memory, leaving behind their legacy in the form of ice tombs scattered throughout the Siberian wilderness, eventually being rediscovered by Russian researchers in the 20th century. They left a profound mark on world history, bringing down the world powers of their day and debuting a form of warfare that would endure until the invention of guns. A people known as the Ossetians, who now live in modern-day southern Russia, speak a language that is remnant of the Scythian Sarmatian dialect, and one can hear echoes of the ancient Scythian language to this day.